as far as both print media and channels were concerned, at the time of elections, it was an open secret that a very large part of a candidate's election budget was being spent on management of news. It's a hard reality. However difficult it may be, the Election Commission tried its best to find out the details and stop it, but because of the nature of the underground activity in which it happens, it was very impossible for the, it was reasonably impossible for the Election Commission to take action on this. The Supreme Court judgment in the Tata Press case which mentioned that uh, a commercial news is also news and therefore protected under Article 191A. Justice Sikri, I can see him smiling because uh, at one stage we were both uh, concerned with that judgment. I have always wondered how the paid news menace is going to be tackled in view of that where advertisement is also Article 191A. Would this aberration of paid news also be protected under that wide horizons that the court has laid down? Or would it have to be kept out on account of some principles? I hope uh, that correction is made someday so that it could be made or converted into a penal offense. You then had an impact of this impacting on the quality of news itself. And when I say this impacting on the quality of news, in that race for TRPs, pressure on the news collection budgets of news channels, recruitment of staff which is qualitatively not the best across the country, some of course hire very good staff. This directly impacts on the quality of reportage. And therefore if there is a complicated uh, issue, you would find different versions of it appearing as news. For instance, I can safely assume that a serious analysis of the kind which we are making just now could find itself reported with a headline, Jetly Slams Media. <laughs> because that's the easy way to understand a more complicated subject of this kind. I always uh, jokingly have mentioned that I found uh, two recent speeches of mine reported which I had not delivered. <laughs> I tried to analyze as to how the aberration took place. I delivered some other speech, I saw a report of something else. Both functions were held early morning. And generally reporters are not in the habit of uh, covering all early morning events. So somebody who must have gone and covered it, inaccurately reported it, the others all followed suit. So it's, it, it's an occupational hazard for us. But now, as I said earlier, there is an empowerment of the politician also. Because the moment you see a wrong reportage, you don't run behind after editors. You just put your own blog. So I've got into the habit of putting onto the Facebook or onto the YouTube the actual speech. And with just a noting, this is what I said, what has been reported is completely at variance. Please, those who are interested may watch the speech at this address. The relieving fact is that there is so many channels, so many different mediums, newspapers, that it really today doesn't matter even if two or three of them misreport it. Because your correct reportage and your fairness will emerge out of the competitive system. Even if somebody unfairly targets you, or somebody takes a view which you think is unfair, there will be at least 95% others who are taking a broadly correct and fair view. So you have a medium available with you to, to, to resort to that medium itself. The challenges, therefore, are from within. It's a challenge of quality. It's a challenge of competitiveness, but still being fair. It's a challenge of credibility.
the digital medium it is today still not certain as to what the financial model of the digital medium itself is going to be it's too early but i am sure uh, as the medium is growing and maturing the financial model itself uh, would also evolve as far as the sense of responsibility is concerned it is difficult to define this just as ravindran mentioned that the government would uh, try and discipline those who are outside the scope of the self regulatory mechanism so i find it uh, extremely difficult because it may have its own pitfalls if the government got into the business of starting to discipline media organizations i would be more comfortable if the viewers or the readers decided to discipline them if they find you way out of the mark rather than government step in and tell you what to report and what not to report i'd rather the viewers just with the power of the remote in their hands decide to switch on to something else and therefore when you find your own falling viewerships or readerships that will be a much better way for people to deal with it the media today has a responsibility to be credible to be fair to be an educator on sensitive issues and itself to maintain the highest standards of financial integrity and ethics i also am of the opinion the media will have to be extra careful where its own interests are involved and therefore where there ever there is a possibility of a conflict of interest an adequate disclosure to that effect has to be made in terms of responsibility there are at least three such specific illustrations where media will now have to seriously introspect the first is how do you report instances when an insurgent action is on when a security operation is in full play the desire of the media to be an actor in these events and to go into the midst of the scene and therefore report from the spot as to what is happening or should the media have some constraints you have the reporting of 911 versus the reporting of 2611 as an exception you had intelligence information to say that because indian television channels had decided to make the 2611 reporting almost in real time as to what action was being taken the terrorists inside the hotels were being informed on their satellite phones by their handlers as to what the indian security forces were doing from outside and therefore in the larger interest of a 192 exception the security of state can this be permitted to go on our security agencies and the ministry of defense is clearly of the view that this cannot be allowed and therefore during the limited duration where a security operation is on a very strict discipline on the kind of reporting which is to take place from the place of the incident will have to be imposed this issue is under serious and very advanced considerations as far as the government is concerned the second issues relate to privacy of individuals the privacy of individuals even in high profile cases is also a part of their right and therefore the media will have to evolve an ethics as to what was the relationship between a husband and a wife what was the kind of conversation they were having 
Now, these areas which have absolutely no bearing on larger public interest can only add some spice to the content of the reporting. The media will have to seriously introspect as to what extent this has to be reported. The third illustration which Justice Ravindran just mentioned, has the sub judice rule been completely given a go by? I can quite understand in larger matters of public interest, merely because an issue is pending in a court, you cannot have a complete gag on the media. There'll be issues relating to, assuming there is a constitutional confrontation between the center and the state, or between a state and a state. The issue will find a mention in the media. But if it is issues relating to individual culpability, where innocence or guilt has to be judged, the parallel trial concept, therefore prejudicing the entire environment around which a person is to get justice, is seriously under challenge as far as India is concerned. I am constrained to observe that as far as certain trial courts are concerned, this may not hold true of the judicial institution all through, are under tremendous pressure, particularly in high-profile cases, where media has conducted a parallel trial and almost declared somebody guilty or innocent. The other illustration is where there is social tension in society. It could be a caste problem, it could be a communal problem, as to the nature of reporting. Print media conventionally followed a principle as to the manner in which the reporting is to be done. But if when trouble is on, media is capable of creating a frenzy. We saw a recent frenzy is about a year or two ago, where children from northeastern states started migrating en masse from various states back to their homes because of the kind of frenzy against them, which was not there on the ground, but a campaign on the media had been created. How this can impact on fairness of trials, my earlier point, the most illustrative case is uh, O.J. Simpson's case. Trial by jury, it showed the failure of the jury system, where the media reporting the testimony of every witness then analyzing the quality of testimony of every witness, being a national debate on American television, the entire jury in the Simpson case was then split on racial lines. People belonging to one color decided and took a one view, and people belonging to another color took another view. So this is a kind of frenzy that media has the capacity to create. Therefore, in social uh, uh, tensions, uh, in, 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 in trials, uh, what is the extent uh, of uh, frenzy that a media can create and therefore the extent of restraint that is to be required in the quality of reporting. Just as privacy was the right to be left alone, the digital media, unlike newspapers, and television, which has a momentary impact, or a one-day impact, or a one-hour impact, <coughs> the digital media has a, has a permanent record. And therefore, if something inaccurate, something which is defamatory, something which is scandalous, relating to an individual, appears on the digital media, and digital media has shown a tendency that its standards of uh, responsibility are still lacking compared to the other sections of the media, it can lead to permanent libel against individuals and make them symbols of controversy. So just as the courts in India and elsewhere in the world have evolved the right to be left alone, the European Court of Justice has now evolved the right to be forgotten. I have a right not to be in public gaze all the time. And therefore, if something inaccurate has been said about me, I have a right to decide that I must be kept away from public gaze, and therefore, directions can be issued 
to the digital media as a part of my right to be forgotten to erase what has been put on the digital mode itself. We are discussing this uh, at a time, and I, when I mentioned uh, the capacity of the media to create blasphemy, to create uh, a frenzy, particularly in relation to caste and religious matters, the reporting will have to be done with utmost care and caution. The kind of trends we are seeing globally, and I cannot conclude this uh, lecture held as a tribute to Justice Varma without a reference to what happened in Paris. What should be the content of what is published is one issue of debate, and I'm sure that issue will go on. But what should be the reaction against that? What happened in Paris uh, against a magazine which specialized in uh, humor, sarcasm, I think has to be condemned by one and all. Because if this trend picks up, we've had threats from the state. But as civility in public administration has grown, the threat from the state in terms of banning, in terms of censorship, have globally diluted. We have now have challenges from within. We have the financial challenge and so on. But then if attacks of this kind take place, a humor magazine or a sarcasm magazine is supposed to make fun of people. It is supposed to be one step ahead of the rest of the medium. And therefore, if they are to be slaughtered in their, this manner, free speech is likely to be very adversely effective. In fact, if we recollect uh, a case nearer home, a period which is always very fresh in my memory, the emergency, where all newspapers were censored, the first and one of the only magazines to decide to close down its publication was the Shankar's Weekly. Shankar's Weekly for decades was India's humor and sarcasm magazine. And therefore, it had to make fun of people who were in governance and in public life. By making fun of people, they have to be told, the governors had to be told what people think of them. So I was in prison at that time where uh, when Shankar's Weekly decided to close down and Mr. Shankar wrote the closing editorial. I don't remember the exact uh, language, but it was broadly to this extent, he started by saying that humor has no place in dictatorships because dictators don't like people laughing at them. And therefore, my magazine has completely lost its relevance, and I have decided to close down this magazine. And Shankar's Weekly closed down during the emergency with this observation. While I conclude, there are two issues which are currently in debate even in India in relation to the nature of the media and the subjects that I have addressed you on. I referred to the Sakal and the Bennett Coleman cases as to how much a newspaper can publish, what should be the volume of advertisements. It will be music to Rajat and other media persons' ears on hearing this view from me, my, one of my ministry, the Information and Broadcasting Ministry, a couple of years ago, came out with the, a statutory amendment to law saying, no channel will telecast advertisement beyond so many minutes. I have str been struggling myself in my own mind since then as to how this meets the challenge of Article 191A. Is the government supposed to tell newspapers and channels how much advertisement and how much news? Or if the viewers or the readers find it's monotonous, they have the power to switch on to something else. Because government getting into the business of how much news and how much advertisement, in my personal view, is a bad uh, precedent to lay down. And if we go by the traditional test, 
may be a suspect as far as Article 191A is concerned. The challenge is before court. Some of my officers are also here, and they are already familiar with my views on this particular subject. The second view, which is an issue I am just placing for public uh, discussion and debate. Most jurisdictions world over ban cross holdings in the media. If you own newspapers, you can't own channels. If you own channels, then you can't own the medium through which a channel is telecast, that is the cable or the DTH. Some jurisdictions like the United States have very strict disciplines in this. But then they don't have Article 191A in the exact language. We have no such restriction. Should all these mediums, including the medium to communicate, can they vest in the same individual? How is larger public interest going to be impacted by this? I think a time has come for this debate in the media circles and in the judicial circles at some stage, and certainly thereafter, as far as parliament is concerned, to be initiated so that Indian society can form a mature view on these kind of restrictions that other jurisdictions have. And I'm sure with the kind of uh, uh, maturity Indian society shows in dealing with the free speech and the rights, this debate will also evolve and lead to a conclusion. I once again pay my tribute to the memory of Justice Varma, who we all admired, and I thank you very much for your kind audience.